doable. Uh, we'll give it another try now, I guess. Uh, because lately, I'm sorry to say, economic policy has not been much more intelligent than it was back in the early 1930s. The, the Federal Reserve System has undertaken, out of what appears to be stark panic, to inject itself not just into the market for U.S. government securities, where it historically undertook its so-called open market operations to influence short-term interest rates, but it has undertaken to inject itself into a gigantic variety of financial and credit markets. It'll go out and buy securities uh, from uh, commercial paper dealers, from, from securities dealers, from people that make student loans. Oh, I should let them off on that, I guess. Uh, uh, car loans, uh, loans to buy guns and ammo. I think that was a slip up actually, but, but it happened. <laughs> so you know, the Fed has undertaken these huge number of, of programs. I, mean, I don't even know how many they've done. I've, I've been looking for compilations for months, so I get a kind of encyclopedic collection of what the Fed has done. I keep finding new ones that I didn't know about before. I mean, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. So the Fed used to own these multi-billions of dollars worth of U.S. government securities. That was the asset side of its portfolio, so-called. Now, now they've given away or sold most of those U.S. government securities, and instead they've purchased to replace them and add enormously to them in nominal value all these junk bonds of various sorts, crappy securities, toxic things. Ooh, don't touch those those, those securities, they're poison. That's another odd metaphor, isn't it? Toxic securities. <laughs> I can understand if a security is worthless. <laughs> you know, that's how we normally think about securities. What price will they fetch? But toxic? My goodness, that sounds horrible. Uh, one of the things I enjoy in my spare time is metaphors. So I spent a lot of time looking at political lingo and economic policy making lingo because it's all used to engage the emotions and to distort people's thinking about uh, substantive matters. And uh, you can learn a lot from looking at the terms people choose to express themselves in this area. But the Fed is a, as a result of acquiring all these junk securities, it's, it's built up bank reserves and, to a level more than twice as great as they were last August, August of 2008. It did that in five months' time. Between August 2008 and January of 2009, the Fed more than doubled the monetary base of the United States. Okay? What had taken over two centuries to build <laughs> was doubled in five months. Hey, the sky's the limit, right? And in fact, they're still talking about doing more along those lines. Right now, they're having those talks, thinking about new programs for the Fed to go out and, and be the lender of first resort. Because think about this. If you're selling crappy securities, do you want a low price in the market, or do you want a high price from the Fed? That's a no-brainer. And so a lot of people, having enough brains, you know, not to get themselves into this trouble, that, that's true, they weren't that smart, but having enough brains to see that getting something for nothing from the Federal Reserve System is still worth doing, are doing it. And, and uh, these so-called toxic securities, which the government says are, are, are clogging up the markets because nobody knows their value. Well, how would anybody find out their value? If everybody has a perfect incentive to sit waiting for the government to buy them for vastly more than they're actually worth. They got that much of an, an idea of what they're worth. <laughs> okay. and you tell me all those you know, MIT uh, PhDs can't figure out what these derivatives are worth? Nonsense. They told us all about these securities before. They're the ones that built all these derivatives, credit default swaps and the rest of us. And they, they built them in such a way that they could not fail. Well, they just forgot one or two things, I guess. But 
Anyhow, these are bright guys. They could figure out how much to bid for securities. But they're not doing it because everybody's waiting to be bailed out for the government. And the government has proven that it stands ready to bail out anybody and everybody with a lobbyist. With a lobbyist. One of the, one of the bright spots I've read about in the recent economy is uh, upscale hotels in Washington, D.C. You know, those places the lobbyists occupy. They've been doing grand in the last six months. Hard to get in there. It's cheek by jowl with those, <clears throat> those guys. So we've got a lot of nonsense floating around and a lot of bad policy being done in response. Uh, sometimes you have to decide when you think about government policy. Your choices are fools or charlatans. And I'm, I'm often drawn, actually, to the idea that it's both, <laughs> that, that you don't really have to choose. That yes, the people who make these policies are charlatans. Uh, I don't think it's total coincidence that Goldman Sachs has come out of this mess smelling like a rose. <laughs> Call me a suspicious guy. <laughs> I don't think that's a total accident. I think charlatanism is alive and well in our, in our policy making. Uh, but at the same time, I think they're fools also. Even if they weren't charlatans, I think they'd screw up. Because how can they know? These are human beings, fallible as anybody else, trying to substitute their decisions, their judgment, and their knowledge for the decisions, judgment, and knowledge of millions of well-placed people scattered around the world interacting through decentralized markets. Human beings can't substitute for that. It's the fatal conceit, to borrow the term from Hayek. It's the fatal conceit. Fatal's the right adjective, too. It can kill. It has killed. That conceit killed millions, hundreds of millions in the 20th century alone, as tyrannical governments tried to substitute their bureaucratic judgments for the market. The body count is enormous. It can be added to. All we have to do is turn to the state and beg for its salvation. And believe me, everybody's ready to do that with only a handful of exceptions. So <clears throat> this is sort of where we are. Now, one upshot of this is what I mentioned earlier, regime uncertainty. Regime uncertainty is the name I gave to the situation that arose in the 1930s, particularly from 1935 on, because uh, at that point, uh, Roosevelt decided that his political fortunes would be best served if he fomented class warfare, more so than he had already. So he, under the influence of, of advisors like, you know, like Tom Corcoran and Ben Cohen and James Landis and other people, he began to, 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 to threaten to demagogue, to, to uh, invite, as he put it, the hatred of the princes of property, the economic royalists, his terms, not mine. Okay? He attacked the entire investor class. Now, was that a smooth move? Politically, yes. In 1936, after he had done this for a year and a half or so, he was reelected by a gigantic margin. The opponent won only two states in the Electoral College, and they were little ones. Okay. So, yeah, astute politics, but what, what was the economic consequence of stirring up this kind of uncertainty about where the world was headed with regard to private property rights? The consequence was that practically no long-term investment was made for the whole 10 years of the Great Depression and more. If you're going to make an investment, you better have a short-term payoff. Otherwise, you might find yourself caught when the country goes full-out fascist or socialist. Because the way Roosevelt was talking, it might not be very long before you got there. And there are a lot of different ways, I've produced some of them in my research, to show that, that this was serious. This wasn't just talk on the part of the plutocrats. Historians tend to dismiss this and say, oh, these Republican plutocrats, what do you think they'd say? But look at where they put their money. Okay? That tells you a lot. And if you look at that, what you see is they were very frightened. 
extremely frightened, and their fright didn't really get over until the war came along and turned the economy into a centrally controlled war state for, for five years. And then when the war ended and the war controls came off for the most part, once again, these investors were willing to come out, Roosevelt dead, New Deal in retreat, and make long-term investments. So the economy prospered at that point.